God, we just come before you and we thank you. We thank you for meeting with us and being in this place. God, we want to hear from you today. Holy Spirit, we give you the room. So do whatever you want to do. Touch every one of our hearts and our minds. I pray that we would hear from you today. Give direction. Lord, I'm asking for direction for those that need direction. I'm asking, God, that even in the the scriptures that we're going to read today, for some of us, we've read these numerous times. We've heard the story. God, would you show us something we never saw before? Would you breathe life into the word, touch our minds, give us fresh revelation, help us to see something we never saw before, hear something we never heard before, understand something we didn't understand before. God, give us revelation. God, we just thank you for being here and meeting with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today I'm going to talk about Palm Sunday, and we're going to talk primarily what was happening during Passion Week. And you might have heard that before, Passion Week, and it's like, what is, what is Passion Week? Why do, they, why do they call this week leading up to Easter, why do they call it the Passion Week? And really, the simple reason is, it's man's best attempt to say, man, Jesus was really passionate about what he came to do, and this he was about to fulfill. And so Passion Week kicks off with Palm Sunday, and we sang about it, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And... And then, then there was a series of events that happened that led Jesus to celebrate what was known as Passover. And I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory during the service today so you understand. Because people say, well, you know, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? People talk about Jesus as the, the lamb who was slain. Why a lamb? Like he's referred to a lion, he's referred to a lamb. Like which is it? He's the son of God, he's the son of man, which is it? And the answer is yes, he's all of those things. And God, one of the top metaphors that God used to describe Christ is the lamb. There's 104 instances in the New Testament alone where Jesus is referred to as the lamb. And so if the Bible makes such a big deal about Jesus being the Passover lamb, then maybe we should take notice of that and say, okay, what does that exactly mean? And so John 12 tells this story, John 12, 12 through 13, We're going to hop around a little bit between John and Luke, and then I'm going to take you back into the the Old Testament, into Exodus, and we're going to unpack that first Passover and why it's so important. So John chapter 12 says this, the next day the great crowd had come to the festival. They heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and they took palm branches, and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. We read that. We sang that this morning. So they're all coming out. They're hearing that Jesus is coming. And for them, what they were really desiring is they were were desiring a military leader that would free them from the oppression of Rome. So they wanted a physical deliverance, and God wanted to deliver them spiritually. And sometimes you can come to Christ And you can want one thing in the external. He wants to do something in your heart. He wants to do something internal, internally in you. Because he knows that if you can get the internal right, it doesn't matter what's going on around you. It doesn't matter the waves that are trying to crash over your boat. You can have confidence because Jesus is in the boat with you. And that's where he wants to be with every single one of us. And then then we're going to fast forward to Luke 22. And this leads up to this moment where they're going to have a supper. So Jesus comes into the city. He tells his disciples, he says, we, I want you to, he tells two of them, he goes, I want you to go into the town. You're going to get a colt that's never been ridden before, and you're going to untie it. The owner's going to come out and ask, what are you doing with my colt? <laughs> and you're going to say that the Lord needs it. And he's going to say, okay, take it. And so that's what happens. A couple disciples go away. They're on, they find a colt that's never been ridden. They untie him. They're starting to lead him away. And the guy's like, hey, what are you doing with my Ford F-150? Like, where are you taking, what are you doing with my, like, the Colt, the Colt was a mode of transportation, right? And, and so it, it, was, it was a workhorse. And so he's like, what are you doing? He's like, the Lord needs it. And the guy says, okay, you can go ahead and take it. So they bring it back to Jesus, and then they, they, they put Jesus on the, the Colt, which was kind of like a, a, a baby. And Jesus is, 
led into the city, and as he's going in, they're shouting, Hosanna in highest. They're laying down the palm branches, which was a symbol of worship out of Exodus or Leviticus 24. They're laying down these palm branches, and they're worshiping, they're praising the Messiah. And Jesus receives it. And Kara read it earlier during worship, but the Pharisees, they rebuke them. They're like, what are you, like, you're allowing these people to say that you're God. And Jesus, Jesus is like, yeah, and if I didn't, then the rocks would cry out. And so worship continues. He goes in. Some of you know the story. First thing he does, he goes into the temple and he turns over the money changers. He's like, this is not what God had for my church. You're turning it into something it was never designed to be. My house would be called the house of prayer. And, and, and Jesus took time before he turned over the temples. I love the story. If you want to, we're not going to unpack it today, but if you go back and read it, he took time and sat down and actually made a whip. And he's thinking about what he's about to do. Like he's turned, like he was serious about this. It's one of the reasons that Authentic Church, one of our attributes that we're passionate about is that this would be a house of prayer. That prayer is a catalyst. It's not just something we kind of do. No, no, it's who we are. Like we are a praying church. And so Jesus turns over the tables. He's has some debates. He has, he has some time and, and gives some instructions. And then it leads up to Passover. Now, Passover was one of the most holy days of their calendar year. Holiday is where you get, is from holy days. It was a holy day. So they're celebrating the Passover feast. And so he tells them, I want you to go find a house, and you're going to find there's going to be an upper room area, and we're going to go and celebrate Passover together. So his disciples find a place, they go there, and he's sitting there. And this is what he says to them, Luke chapter 22, verse 15 through 20. I'm going to read out of the NIV. There's Bible on the screen here for those of you that need it. And Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, he's been walking with his disciples now for three and a half years. He had already celebrated some Passovers with them. But he says, I've eagerly desired to have this particular Passover with you. Something's about to shift. There's a shift. And sometimes when you go to church or you're involved in, there's things that you've done year in and year out. You've gone to Easter service. You've, you've, you've maybe taken a, a new believers class. You, and, and suddenly Jesus shows up in the middle of it. He goes, yeah, but this one's different. Th this Sunday's different. Never underestimate what God will do this time that we gather, this particular time that we meet. He says, for I tell you, verse 16, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Till what finds fulfillment? Passover. So Passover was symbolic of what Jesus was about to do. And for over a thousand years, they had been celebrating this that led to this moment. So Jesus is having the Passover meal with him, which we know is the Last Supper. They didn't know it was the Last Supper. They weren't all sitting on one side of the table saying cheese for a picture that an artist was going to paint out one day, right? They, they just knew they were gathered with the Lord. They were celebrating Passover, but this was going to be a different one. And like every Passover, Jesus leads them in this, and he takes the cup. In verse 17, it says, after taking the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we can hear that and we can just kind of quickly go through the story. But he's, he's, he's pausing. He's, he's having intent, an intentional moment with them. He's not just saying this and going, okay, we're going to eat the bread. We're going to drink the cup. No, no, no. He's saying, I want you guys to pause. I want you to reflect. And every time that you're going to do this from now until the end of time, you're going to, whenever you do this, you're going to remember me. You're going to remember what I did on the cross, what I'm about to do. He's telling them that about what is to come. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant. Everybody say, new covenant. It's the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, three years before this moment, 
John the Baptist, who's a cousin of Jesus, older, older cousin of Jesus, John the Baptist has this to say in John 1.29. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Lamb of God. What is John talking about? He's talking about Passover. They were celebrating the lamb that was slain and the blood that went over the doorposts of the people of Israel so that the angel of death would pass over them, that they wouldn't receive death and destruction, and that they would be free. And now there's a new covenant that Jesus is establishing. And before he does it, right as his ministry is getting going, John says, behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. And when he said the Lamb of God, people knew what he meant. But sometimes we can read it, and you've gone through your scripture, maybe you're newer to Christ, and you're like, what is all this, like, Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah, and what is this? What is this talking about? And so I want to take a little bit of time and unpack. So the first Passover, let me back up. So Jesus is celebrating Passover, the Last Supper, and if you go back a thousand years beforehand, there was the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? Okay. So God established a covenant with Abraham. Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. Jacob has a bunch of sons. One of his sons was Joseph. Joseph's brothers didn't like him because their dad made the, the dumb move that sometimes parents make, and he showed greater favoritism for that son than his other kids. So Joseph's older brothers are like, we're done with him. So they, they end up faking his death. They sell him in slavery. He gets sold and he ends up down in Egypt. There's a lot of stuff that happens to him in Egypt, but long story short, after a season where he felt like, where are you, Lord? God began to promote him. Anybody gone through a season, you're like, where are you, Lord? Where are you in this? I can't see you in this. And then suddenly, before you know it, like you blink your eyes and it's like, oh my goodness, I'm pro I, I see the promotion on my life and I can look back and I didn't realize when I was going through that that God was gonna use it for this moment. And that's what happened to Joseph. And so Joseph becomes second in command to Pharaoh down in Egypt. Now what happened was there was a famine in the land. So there's no, there's no rain. It's crazy hot. Stuff's not growing. Things are dying. People are dying. What's going to happen? There's a famine in the land. But what, because of Joseph's interpretation of dreams, he interprets Pharaoh's dream and says what we need to do is stockpile a bunch of stuff for seven years of plenty and then we're going to have that for the seven lean years that are coming. So they do that. Well, as the famine continued on, Joseph's brothers get sent by their dad. They're like, hey, we hear that there's food over in Egypt. You guys should go down there and check it out. So Joseph's brothers go down to Egypt. They check it out. They meet Joseph. They don't recognize him because he's got like, whatever, mascara on. He's looking, walking like an Egyptian. So they don't recognize him. He's changed a lot in the 17 years that they hadn't seen him. And so there's Joseph and, and he's, have, he's having a conversation with them. They don't even know who he is. And, and then Joseph discloses to them, he's like, I'm Joseph. And they're like, oh, he's going to kill us. He's like, I'm not going to kill you. What you thought you, you were doing to me for harm, God actually used that for good. Go get dad and the rest of the families and bring them all here. We're going to bless them. We're going to take care of them. So they go. Beautiful story. It's awesome. Tears cried. Family reunion. Hallelujah. Well, 400 years goes by. 400 years. I mean, think of that. America's only been around for 248 years-ish, right? Uh, somebody can fact check me later, uh, but around that, around that, less than 250 years. So 400 years, like they were there. And in the 400 years, there was many pharaohs that came and went. There was families that, that lived. There was pa people that died. There was patriarchs that died. Family leaders died, etc. And now there's a whole new generation that's grown up and, th and they kind of hear some of the stories, but they don't really carry the weight of what that story represented. And now you have a new pharaoh in power and he takes a look one day and he starts to think, man, all these Israelites, Hebrews, they call them, all these, all these Hebrews, like, they're like taking over. Like, if we're not careful, they're going to take over Egypt. And we can't do that. So they begin to oppress them and they enslave them. And they're like, you're going to be labor. And so they enslave them and, and there's this whole thing that happens. And in the middle of that, this guy Moses is born. Moses is born 
And when he, when he comes onto the scene, some of you, you might have seen uh, the, the movies or what have you, but they were going around and they were like, we need to kill the Egyptian men, or the, excuse me, the Israelite men, the Hebrew babies. We need to kill the babies because if they continue to multiply, like it's not going to be good for us. Horrific. And so they do that, and God at the same time had sent the Moses as a deliverer. So he's a baby, and he ends up getting raised by a series of miraculous events. He gets raised in the house of Pharaoh. And then as he gets older, he discovers, wait, I'm not Egyptian, I'm Hebrew. I, I, I'm with these Israelites. And he has a heart for them. And then some things happen, and he goes out in the desert on the run, and he leaves that area, and he's in the desert, and then he has an encounter with God. And the encounter with God leads him back to Pharaoh and back to the people of Israel, and he comes as a leader, and he basically tells them, Hey, man, God has seen you. He's seen what you're going through. He's heard the cries. He's seen the tears. He's heard your prayers. He wants to deliver you. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and says the famous line, let my people go. And so, and Pharaoh's like, no, we won't let them go, right? And so they go back and forth, and there's 10 plagues that end up happening that lead to the 10th plague, which was the firstborn. Now, 10 is an important number when you read through Scripture. In Genesis 1, 10 times, God said uh, is recorded, which is a testimony of his creative power. So God said, and then he spoke things into existence. 10 different times in Genesis 1, God gave 10 commandments to them after he brought them out of Egypt. A tithe is a tenth of our earnings. The Passover lamb gets selected on the 10th day of the first month. The tenth day of the seventh month is also the holy day known as the Day of Atonement. And there was ten generations that lived on the earth before Noah and the floodwaters came. So ten is an important number. So on the tenth time, it's kind of like, it's done. Like, like you're, you're, you're not going to be able to withstand what's about to happen. So on that tenth time, there was the plague of the firstborn. And on the plague of the firstborn, God instructed them. He said, I want you to take a Passover lamb. I want you to select a lamb for this, this special moment. And if you slay this lamb, and then you're going to take its blood, and you're going to put it over the doorpost of your home, as the angel of death goes throughout Egypt in this area at night, he's going to pass over your house. Your house is going to be saved. And so they have their first Passover. And then they would celebrate this. For over a thousand years, they would celebrate the Passover. And it was God's reminder of what was to come. So Jesus, that we just read about in John, he says, I've eagerly had waited to celebrate this Passover with you. So a few things about the Passover lamb. Number one, the Passover lamb had to be perfect. The Passover lamb had to be perfect. Exodus 12, 5 says this, the animals you choose must be year old males without defect and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Now, Palm Sunday is the day when, when, the, when the priests would actually inspect the lambs that were going to be slain. So on Palm Sunday, when Jesus is doing the triumphal entry, riding in, at that exact time in Jerusalem at the temple, the lambs were brought before the priests and they were expecting to make sure that that lamb was perfect. And Jesus is the perfect lamb, rides into the city on that exact same day. Interesting to note, the Passover lambs that they used for the sacrifice, those lambs were actually raised in Bethlehem. And it was probable, very, very highly likely, according to, according to most theologians, that when the angels show up at the birth of Christ and they appeared to the shepherds, that those shepherds were the shepherds that were watching over the lambs that would be raised as the Passover lamb. So Jesus is the perfect Passover lamb. 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 through 19 says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life that was handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So Peter, who was one of the apostles, one of the first disciples of Christ, he's writing this and he's telling them, look, you guys have been celebrating for Passover for years. Jesus is the Passover lamb. 
So the Passover lamb had to be perfect. Number two, the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Sacrifice is kind of, it's kind of a nice word. Really, the Passover lamb had to be slaughtered. Like, slaughtered. Unrecognizable. Like, if, if, if you've seen or read about some of the depictions that happened when they would slaughter the animals, like, it was a bloodbath. Christ took on him the sins of the world, and he paid the price, and he... It's like we, we say sacrifice and maybe you watch an old movie of Jesus getting crucified and, and, and he's on the cross. It was a bloody mess. He was unrecognizable what he took. The lamb had to be sacrificed. Exodus 12, 6, going back to Exodus. In God's original instruction for the Passover, it said, take care of them until the 14th day, talking about the lambs. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community, Israel, must slaughter them at twilight. Now there was a prophet many years later named Isaiah. So many years after this, about 700 years before Jesus, 740 years before Christ was born, there was a prophet named Isaiah who got raised up. In one, one, in one moment in all of his writings, Isaiah is praying and he has a a picture, God gives him a revelation, gives him a glimpse, kind of like a, a, a vision of the Messiah and what would come. In Isaiah 53, 5, he says this, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, we are healed. Let me tell you one little thing here. Notice it says, by his wounds, we are healed. He's saying this 740 years before Christ would be born. By his wounds, we are healed. Let me tell you, if, you, if, if your wounds are healed back then, that means your, the wounds that you face now can be healed. That, that there is healing that God can do in your heart that medicine can't get to. There's healing that can come from the power of the Holy Spirit that no 12-step program can get to, no counselor can get to, only God and the Holy Spirit can get to and heal in different areas of your life. And that's what we're believing to happen on Easter Sunday, that people are going to encounter God and they're going to experience healing. They're going to experience healing in their lives. So the perfect, the perfect Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And then number three, the Passover lamb was meant to be shared he was meant to be shared. Exodus 12, 4 says this. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, then they must share it with their nearest neighbor. And I got my neighbor, we share a wall, literally, uh, sitting right here in the second row. You share it with your nearest neighbor. You know, I said it earlier, but 86% of people who say yes to Jesus do so from an invitation of coming to church on Easter Sunday. And what could, what could your neighborhood look like? If you shared the lamb, <laughs> just shared the lamb with somebody that doesn't know him. What, what, what could friends, family members, what could it look like if you just shared the lamb with them? I mean, that, that was the instruction to the people of Israel back in the book of Exodus, that they would share the lamb, that you need to share it with people. And that's still the instruction today. And, you know, the heartbeat of authentic church I, I, I don't necessarily care if we're a big church per se. I want to be found a faithful steward of everything and every person that God brings to this house. That's our heartbeat. But as long as there is a seat next to you, there's somebody that needs to receive and be and, and, and receive Jesus, the Lamb. We need somebody that needs just an invitation to be shared, to share the Lamb. So our heartbeat is that we're going to share the Lamb. Philemon 1, 6 says, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. That's my prayer. God, I just pray, God, would you help us be effective in the sharing of our faith? Help me be effective in sharing the gospel. Help me be effective in reaching out to people. So again, the Passover lamb had to be perfect. The Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. That's why he came. And the Passover lamb was meant to be shared. Exodus 12 is all about that first Passover. And Jesus says to his disciples, after three and a half years of ministry, three and a half years of spending time with them, 
He says, I've eagerly awaited this moment. And on Easter Sunday, there's people that are going to come into this house that have never been to a church before. And Jesus is saying, I've been eagerly awaiting this moment. And they're going to come in and we're going to celebrate and we're going to love on God and put a smile on his face. We're going to spend time with the Lord. And in this atmosphere of faith, just as you encountered God in something similar, they're going to encounter God. And I just want you to know as your pastor, like we are going to be very intentional on Easter Sunday. We're going to have actually, a, I, I, I want to have a survey that we're going to hand out to people, a little connect card, if you will. And I'm going to ask them to put their information in and say, hey, if you were to know God or if you wanted to grow in a relationship, what are some areas that you would want to know about God? And they're going to fill it out. And then there's going to be a part at the bottom of that survey where they're going to receive an invitation, not in an emotional state, not in hype or anything, where they just have a moment with God, reflecting on what Jesus did, reflecting on salvation, and they're going to receive an invitation that just says, would you like to surrender your life to Christ? And people are going to be able to check a box, yes or no. Like, there, there, there's Christians that you know that may not really know God, which isn't actually correct theologically, but because if you're a Christian, like, having a relationship with Christ is knowing God. But there's people that profess to be Christians, but in reality, man, they, they really don't have that relationship. We're going to see that relationship deepen. There's going to be prodigals that used to walk with God that are going to come back to the Lord. There's going to be people that don't have a church home, a church family, and they're going to get invited by somebody, and they're going to walk in, and they're going to feel like, dude, this feels like home. Like, I want to be here. Like, I, I, I don't just want to show up on a Sunday. Like, I want to go all in for Jesus. Like, I, I, want, to, I want to get involved. I want, to, I want to start serving. There's going to be all these different ways that people are get involved. My, what I'm trying to convey is the fact that we are going to be very intentional and I want to share that with you so that you have greater confidence in inviting any family or friend. When they come, they are going to receive a clear message of the gospel. And then we leave it in the hands of God. We leave it in the hands of the Holy Spirit to do what he would want to do. I talked about today being Palm Sunday, and, and it really stems from some of the first praise that happened that was an instruction out of Leviticus. And Actually, it's Leviticus 23, verse 40. I think we have it on the screen. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord for seven days. And you know, that, that wasn't just the only time that we see this in Scripture, that, that waving of palm branches, it happened then, and it was a pattern of worship, and then it happened on the triumphal entry when Jesus rode into town. But there's actually a scene that we receive, if you read the book of Revelation, where John, one of the disciples of Jesus, they couldn't kill him, so they just finally just sent him to an island, and they just said, die old. We don't know what to do with you, but just go there. So they put him on an island, and he sat, and he was having a moment, and he had a vision. Just as Isaiah had a vision of Christ being crucified, John has a vision of this future Palm Sunday. And he, he writes this. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and people and languages, they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes. That means they're saved, y'all. With palm branches in their hands, and they were crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. There is a real heaven, and there is a real hell. And it's our mission as Christians to populate the kingdom of heaven in such a way that it scares the hell out of the devil. That he gets out of people's life. That his hand that has been gripping in addiction, his hand that has been gripping in anger, his hand that has been on them with anxiety and depression, his hand that has been on them with slothfulness, and a lack of purpose, where they're just going through the motions, they're like dead men walking, that that comes off of them, and man, they come alive in Christ. That they feel this sense of purpose, like, man, this is what I was created for. 
And so if you have somebody like that in your life, you're like, I know somebody that needs that. Right now in this moment, we're gonna have a time of reflection and we're gonna, we're gonna pray for that person. As we close today, my first question is, have you received the Passover lamb? We're sharing the Passover lamb with you today. We're sharing him with you. But we can't force anything on you. That's for you to receive. Have you received the Passover lamb? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? And if you don't, the way that you begin a relationship with Jesus is the same way you begin a relationship with a person here on earth. You say hi. <laughs> you begin to talk to them. You begin to communicate with him. And he begins to communicate with you. And you just tell him, Lord, I, I, I want to know you more. I don't know you more. My prayer as a young man, 20 years old, single dad, life's going crazy, don't know what I'm doing, no purpose. My prayer was just simply this. God, if you're real, I want to know you. That was my prayer. I, 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 know, I know some of the stories. I, I know about you. I celebrated Easter and Christmas, and I went to Catholic school, and I, I know some of the stories about you, but I don't know you. And I, if you're real, I want to know you. And in that moment, God just moved in my life. I encountered him in a real way. And everybody's encounter is different. You can't come to God except through Jesus. There is no other way. There is no other way. There is no, you'll never be good enough to receive the love of, or, or to receive a relationship with the Holy God. You'll never be good enough. That's why Jesus came. He came to pave the way. He made a way. And that Passover lamb, from the first time they did it, where they put the blood over the doorposts, represent Christ, who was crucified on the tree, and his blood that was shed, when you come into a relationship with Christ, it's like you're walking inside, and now you've walked through that blood-stained doorpost, and you're in the presence of God, and death cannot have sting anymore in your life. Is there anybody in your world that needs that? Is there anybody in your world where it's like, they know about the blood, they know about Jesus, they see it on your life, they see it on your home, they see it on your family, but they're from the outside looking in. Wouldn't it be nice this Easter to watch them come inside and experience the forgiveness and the love of Christ? For more information on Authentic Church, visit us online at AuthenticOC.com.